Um, this is Reef's 30th anniversary this year for our volunteer fish survey project. The, 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 the cornerstone of Reef's programs, the how it all got started, the why of Reef was the volunteer fish survey project. And um, so we're really excited to kind of take you through a little of how we got here these last 30 years and a little bit of where we're going in the future. So I will take where, what? You still have it? Uh, no? mm, that's right, I'll just use that. So how it all started was uh, this, this is actually a little after it started, but I love this picture that's and um so paul human on the left ned deloach on the right and the amazing miss anna deloach in the middle um keeping them together as i suspect she's done many a time um so as many people know um paul and ned are our reef founders and um so yeah we've got paul actually coming in right now so <laughs> is that it battery came out or Thanks. All right. Well, that was amazing timing. <laughs> so we'll let them get situated for a second. But um, so we are so honored that uh, both Paul and Ned are here to, to join us for this celebration today. Um, it was their vision. They're often we talk about, you know, just as like kind of a, an amazing thing to think about the the thoughts that that kind of one little thing led to another um so long ago that here that brought all of us together right we are this we always talk about this the reef family and the community and the the kind of thing that that um what a gift right that these two guys were able to give us so we're it's such a such a celebration so um, if you think about, maybe not, um, back in the beginning, so here's a, a very young Ned on the left and a very young Paul on the right. Um, way back in the day, I think Paul is there, I think that's in the Springs, I think, and I think Ned, that's uh, maybe in the Bahamas, I'm not sure where you've said that, that picture was taken, looking pretty stealthy stealthily there um but as you know for those of you who who don't know um they uh found their paths together through a whole bunch of really fun stories that anna and um, ned and paul and jim delapazzi a couple years ago at reef fest they did a talk called the heady hunt for five thousand fishes and that is that goes into a lot more i'm just going to give you a few minutes of this but if you want to know the whole story we have that talk archived on our facebook or on our um, youtube channel i recommend you go watch it because it's really great anna dug through all of the old notebooks and has a, have a bunch of slides but this kind of shows the beginning uh, they decided they were going to make a fish ID book for divers and snorkelers. It wasn't going to be the scientific guide with drawings and organized by scientific rules. It was going to be for divers and snorkelers. As they were working on that first book, they realized how little was really known about fish distributions, fish abundances, fish populations. And they kind of gave some thought to, well, that's pretty silly. Because why can't, we've got thousands and thousands of divers and snorkelers in the water every day. Why can't we tap into that? Do for fish what birders have done for birds and the, the understanding of bird communities for over 100 years. The Audubon Christmas bird count started with a simple idea. Some people realized bird populations were going down. We should figure that out. And they went out and started every you know, Christmas going out and counting birds. And that has grown into a huge field, not just in for birds, but for insects, for stars, a whole field now of what's broadly known as 
citizen science or community science. And that is how the Volunteer First Survey Project basically came to be. But how do you go from that simple idea, seemingly simple, that Paul and Ned had to this amazingly successful and impactful program that we have today? Um, you know, one of the key things that really was the success was um, Mr. Ken Marks, who's sitting up with Paul. Woohoo! Um, <laughs> so, uh, Ken, uh, here's a fun old picture of him talking to Ned on a dock. Um, but early on, Paul and Ned found uh, Ken through, you know, diving community, started talking about their idea. And Ken had a computer background. And so he was kind of the, you know, how did, how did the, the success happen? How did we get to where we are today? And there's a couple key things. And, and Ken was one of them. Because what Ken did was he transferred that notion of, are we just going to write it on a napkin and send it in somewhere, you know, write it on at the bar at the end of the day? Or maybe, you know, I think for a while there was talk of floppy disks. We could have them put it on a floppy disk and mail that somewhere. And Ken said, no, I, I, you know, you should use optical scan forms. There should be a way where people can, can report what they're seeing in a systematic way that could be easily transferred into a computer and stored and so that kind of is how it came to be. And a couple of years ago, Ken had saved all of the, the correspondence of, um, and so here's an early, Ken had called NCS, which was the big company that did the bubble forms, the scan forms that we all took our, our tests on when we were younger. They had some phone conversations. She wrote back to Ken and said, you know, this is before email, so this is all like postal mail right? Um, you know, here I checked it out. Here's some ideas. And then there's a lot of back and forth that Ken had with them about, okay, yes, these are the fields we need. This is what it should look like. And then here's a letter on the right from Paul to Ken saying, yes, this is at long last. We're ready to finalize the bubble form. Um, you know, there's some the, oh, pages and pages of these are some last minute changes we're going to do. And, and from these correspondences over a couple of years, led to a data management system that, that has allowed us, we don't use scan forms anymore, but it laid the groundwork to ensure that when people did surveys, the data would be cataloged and saved and accessible in a relatively quick turnaround. It wasn't just gonna go in a shoebox under someone's desk. And that was, that's, I think, one of the keys, the first keys. A second key, <laughs> is that um, they got they had a bunch of help um, in those early days. And so um, they had collaborated with the Nature Conservancy and the fisheries, NOAA Fisheries, and the University of Miami because they wanted to not just create a program. They wanted to create a program that was going to create data that could be useful to the scientific and fisheries um, communities. And as part of that, the Nature Conservancy got involved and provided the effort with a couple of young enthusiastic uh, interns. And this was the summer of 1993, so 30 years ago. So this is me on the right. And then that's my husband, Bryce Simmons, who's going to take over on this talk in a little bit. And then Emily Schmidt, who uh, is our, was the three of us were interns together that summer. And then Eric is there on the left and Eric's here. Um, he's uh, Ned's son-in-law and also the, one of the heads at New World Publications now. And they're all where we are, 30 years ago. Little did we know, here we would be. But we had this amazing opportunity to get in the water every day and test all of these methods out. Try out, you know, are those single few many abundant? Is that going to work? Can you teach someone who knows nothing about fish enough to be able to do the surveys? So that was our task all summer long. We got to go diving every day. It was Pretty amazing. So we did that, and that summer was the first data that were collected here off of Key Largo. Um, over the years, and of course, we took off from there. Um, we have, uh, often I say, we've achieved world domination. So um, we've got now, you know, 1993 started the yellow region, the tropical Western Atlantic, and through the years, we've expanded that survey program all over the world. Um, to these regions, you can pretty much almost in any ocean jump in the water, snorkel or dive, and do a reef fish survey. We've uh, we have collectively, as our survey team, have um, created the world's 
largest fish sightings database, which is pretty amazing. Um, to, then these numbers are always changing, but yes, a couple days ago when we made this slide, 290,668 surveys, almost 300,000 surveys. Surveys on average, it depends, but they're generally it works out to be about an hour a survey, um, some shorter, some longer, but it's, so it's about 300,000 hours of in-water time of data collected that would otherwise not be collected. So it's really providing an amazing resource um, at almost 17,000 sites around the world. 17,000 plus people have done a survey or more. We have some people who've done almost 4,000 surveys. We have a lot of people who've just done it once or twice. And that's really great because those people have experienced what it's like to, to see a little differently, to look differently underwater. Once you do a reef survey, it's very different. You, you experience the underwater world in a very different way. And that's the goal. That was, you know, at the base, that's what we want is for people to have a little bit more engagement, a little bit more appreciation, a different way. Whether they keep surveying or not, they're going to take with that, that experience forever. So um, it's quite a success. So uh, as I said, the Volunteer Fish Survey Project is Reef's cornerstone program. It's how it all got started. Through the years, two programs have grown out of that. Um, Jason talked some about the Grouper Moon Project. We talked some about it yesterday. That is um, a program where we work in collaboration with the Cayman Islands Department of Environment to study one of the largest and last known spawning aggregations of Nassau grouper, which is a critically endangered species, as John told us yesterday. And that's been quite a, a conservation success story. It came out of a reef trip. A bunch of surveyors were there that summer that when that aggregation was discovered, and that partnership grew out of that. And then the Invasive Species Program is the other key program that Reef runs. It's primarily lionfish, but it's more than that because it's, you know, once you teach people what to expect, what to see, how to ID different species, you also start to figure out what, what doesn't belong and what's really rare. Right, so you're giving, it was, it's been a great way to track invasive species and particularly the lionfish. And then overarching all of our work, of course, is education. Our Explorers Education Program, I think Moose talked to us a little bit yesterday at the seminars about that. And we do a lot, of course, education with divers and snorkelers. That's how it got started. But a lot of in-person programming for everyone from kindergartners to you know lifelong learners, grandparents, and everybody in between at our campus here in Key Largo. Um, so what I'd like to do in the next couple of minutes is just run through you know so Paul and Ned had this idea, can help make it happen. Some other really um, great volunteers in the early days who helped us build the you know, the first website and the database and all these things that can help facilitate. But did, you know, what is, what are the data being used for beyond the great um, engagement that's happening with participants, like I was saying before, uh, there have been over 150 scientific publications that have used the reef data, that have included the reef data. It is also um, publicly accessible on our website and all that, but um, so I'm just going to run through a couple of these wide examples, and then I'm going to turn the mic over to Bryce, and he's going to tell us a little bit about what's to come. So um, the first one, this is just uh, that first summer, we kind of solidified the survey method, and Emily Schmidt, the first author there, and her advisor, Kathleen Sullivan at the University of Miami, went on to publish the, the method. So when you tell people, what are you doing? Oh, I'm swimming around. I do the roving diver technique. That's what the official reef method is called. It's actually, this is where that, that's the original paper that described that method. It was put in the Bulletin of Marine Science in 1996, three years later. A couple of years after that, about 10 years, um, that, this was the first notion that reef data were really going to be in, uh, useful in tracking non-native species. This was actually just before lionfish really took off. It was, uh, we were realizing that there was a whole hotspot of non-natives, mostly Indo-Pacific fish that were being found off of the east coast of Florida primarily. And Bryce at the time was in graduate school by then and a bunch of his lab mates and myself 
uh, wrote up this paper that looked at that hotspot that was coming, uh, reef surveyors were reporting all these Moorish Idol, Emperor Angel, things that didn't belong in the Caribbean, but were all off the west coast of Florida. So, you know, whereas a normal uneducated diver might swim by and just, I mean, it just looks like another angel fish. It looks like a butterfly fish, you know, but reef surveyors were noticing, wait a second, that's not supposed to be here. And so being able to put this out, this is actually one of the highest cited reference papers that reef has ever put out, this paper. Um, then, of course, the lionfish happened and expanded throughout the region over the next couple of decades. The reef data, because it was already being collected before the invasion and all throughout the spread of lionfish through the Western Atlantic, is definitely the most, um, it's the largest resource of data for looking at that spread through the years. And this is, there's been a bunch of papers that have been published, but this was actually a pretty recent one that looked at specifically the reef data, the role of citizen science in researching the invasive lionfish across the Western Atlantic. This was published in the journal Diversity just a few years ago, actually. One of the biggest papers that came out in the early days, this was, um, I think, I can't remember the, the year, but this was one of the first that really catapulted reef data into a bigger limelight for researchers. It was um, Chris Stallings, he actually spoke here at ReefFest last year. He used the entire Caribbean data set and looked at how um, fish populations were responding to human populations. And he was specifically looking at some of the bigger predatory fishes, the grouper and sharks and stuff like that. And, and again, this kind of region-wide study wouldn't be possible without the reef data. There's not a, a regional data set that exists that would enable this kind of study. So, and that's happened time and time again. Um, we, when you teach people, you know, what's supposed to be there and what's, you know, doesn't belong, they also figure out, huh, I've never seen that in any guidebook I've ever looked at. And that's um, an instance here, we've had people who have discovered new species and uh, this uh, surveyor, Janet Eyre, has actually dis helped discover two, had two named after her. This is the better looking of the two. It's her shrimp goby. And this was just a couple of years ago. Janet's one of our most prolific Indo-Pacific surveyors. And she definitely has an eye when she sees something that she knows probably is a new species. She's pretty good at helping the scientists ID it and get it um, described. So. That's kind of something that we all achieve, we all hope to achieve someday is have a fish named after us. <laughs> um, of course, there's been a lot of scientific output from the Grouper Moon Project. Um, and this is one of the biggest ones. This was kind of the, the big culminating after about 15 years of protections, um, recovery of critically endangered Nassau Grouper. That was, that was the headlight, um, headline of this paper. It was the cover of the scientific journal. This is a really pretty prestigious journal. The, proceedings of the National Academies and um, has really solidified the conservation success that Reef has had with the Grouper Moon Project. Um, it's not all tropical fish. We, uh, you know, you saw from the world domination map that we have a lot of data from the temperate waters and um, probably be outside of the Caribbean, the Pacific Northwest is, is our second most active region. We have data, lots of surveyors on the west coast of the U.S. and Canada collecting surveys year-round. And um, this was a great paper that came out just about a year ago in fisheries using the reef data set to provide data that, again, wouldn't otherwise be possible. This was a Salish Sea, um, Puget Sound region off Washington in, in Canada paper. And it's not all fish, even though we love to say that fish are the best and fish are the coolest. Um, we do have an invertebrate and algae monitoring program that happens in all of the colder temperate regions. And if you remember yesterday, John was saying that the red list is where you go if you're going to try and look at the status of a species. This was a, the giant um, sunflower sea star off the west coast of the U.S. had a um, dramatic decline happen from a... Um, a disease that hit it, and a lot of them um, perished, and the populations declined rapidly. Well, Reef had already been surveying in that region for about 10 years, so we had a great before data set, and then a during 
data set and now an after data set. So it was a critical piece of data. Um, our data set was for the red list uh, evaluation that happened on this species um, to be able to then get it to that category, which was critically endangered, that highest level that John was telling us about yesterday. And then um, it's also we do collect data on sea turtles all over the world, actually. And um, so there has been a couple papers that have uh, come out about the using our sea turtle data. And interestingly, this was specifically sea turtles that hang out in San Diego. Um, there's a couple that uh, tend to just be there year round. They like it. <laughs> so they, they don't actually leave. And, and this paper that came out a few years ago used that. And then the last paper I just, or kind of use of how the data are being used is this. So this is this hiding in plain sight idea, how you can use the reef data to understand how volunteers learn and how volunteers participate and get better at fish ID. So it actually doesn't have anything to do with the, the fish data at all. It just has to do with how volunteer skills are changing through time. So we were one of several different scientific or citizen science groups that participated in this NSF, NSF study to better understand volunteer skill gain. So of course, you know, like I said, that it's, it's been an amazing three decades. We can't wait for the, the future. Um, I think beyond those early years of really setting reefs up for success with the data set and the, the website and data accessibility, um, it's just, it's a fun and easy program to be a part of. It's, you know, you can do it snorkeling, you can do it diving, you can learn on your own, you can learn with friends, you can learn it on a boat. Um, and the, the data access has been key. That, that early website, you know, we've had a website since 1995. That was kind of right after the internet started. And it's grown through the years and changed and gotten better. But um, the, a key part of it has always been that anybody can access the reef data. That's kind of a central core value of ours. And then kind of the newest thing, you know, is the social media. So having this community tapping into this distributed knowledge, we're all over the world, right? But I need help figuring out what this fish is, or I want to, you know, share the knowledge of what I have. So if it, it's been a really unexpected benefit, I think, of social media platforms like Facebook to be able to help bring our communities together, bring in taxonomists, and help us figure out these little obscure, small differences between um, different fishes. So um, with that, I uh, would like to say that, you know, I really appreciate that we were, we were able to be together today here with our, our co-founders and with Ken and Eric and Bryce and I to all kind of be together and kind of think about, wow, <laughs> 30 years. That's pretty, pretty amazing. So now I'm going to turn it over to Bryce. Okay, thanks, Christy. Um, how long do I have? 15 minutes. 15 minutes. Okay. <sighs> don't, don't be careful. Be careful. Here there be dragons. Okay, so um, yeah, so, so I'm going to kind of riff off of what, where Christy left off, and I'm going to try to walk us through the present and into the future of, of uh, the types of data that we as citizen scientists generate for reef and, and for the resources that we, we care a lot about. Um, I, I'm going to start with where Christy left off, which is this notion of collect, uh, connecting the data that we generate through our reef surveys to uh, to the types of data that our marine resource managers need in order to make informed decisions. And, and there, there, I would argue there is no better way to do that than to try and connect or to do the analysis necessary to see whether or not there is in fact a pattern that matches between the reef data that we've generated and the types of data that, that gold standard fisheries monitoring programs that are federally funded by the government uh, support. So, um, I'm going to walk you through a brief analysis of that. I'll just do the arrows. I'm technologically challenged. Um, and, and let's start with, with where, where the data comes from. So how, how many of you here have done 
a reef survey in the Florida Keys? Okay, most of you. Most of you. And how many of you have had this experience? You get done and you probably spent some large portion of time not only poring over your slate and over your survey and probably some of your photographs and ultimately your computer where you had to go through this process of, of, of nowadays bubble clicking, radio bubble clicking in your data. You have this experience where you think to yourself, I mean, does this really tell us anything? Does this, I mean, probably this tells us something, but what, like, how much am I making a difference here? What, what is it that I'm doing in terms of reporting these data that's making a difference? Can these people, look at their smiling faces, can, can this boatload of lovable yahoos, let's call them, can this bo boatload of yahoos actually generate something worthwhile? And, and I, I mean, I'm a believer, right? So I'm going to say yes, but we can, we can actually, we can formally set up a hypothesis, we can do the science, we can connect our data that we generate, these yahoos generate these data, and we can see whether or not and to what extent it matches what the federal scientists do. What a huge, great heaving gob of money can do to monitor a resource. Can we do something similar? And I'm not kidding about that amount of money. So in this part of the world, we are lucky in that not only do we have lots and lots of us that have collected over the last 30 odd years now, data from the Florida Keys, over that same stretch of time, there is a large federally funded mon fisheries monitoring program called NCRIMP, the National Coral Reef Monitoring Program, that has generated very rigorous data from the same region during the same window of time. And just to give you a flavor for, for the amount of effort that, that federal scientists put into this effort, just in 2020 and 2021 through their monitoring program, uh, they did both benthic monitoring as well as fish monitoring. They sampled over 800 sites, uh, nearly 300,000 square meters of area, well over 1,000 dives, closing in on 2,000 dives, and recorded uh, the better part of half of a million fish. So a huge survey effort. So we're going to take those data over that same window of time, and we're going we're gonna to do some math. Um, the, the details of the math are, are unimportant. Um, except to say that, that the point of, of this math is to allow us to connect uh, it, the, your survey, the data that you report for a given species, whether, you, whether or not you bubble single, few, many, or abundant, or importantly, you don't bubble anything at all because you did not see the fish, to connect that particular observation to the types of models that are used in stock assessment scientists, science. That's what we're doing here. So each one of these responses here, these abundances, A, is what you reported in your survey on that day that you did a survey on molasses reef back in 1996. Okay, and we're gonna, we're gonna account for these other factors which we know to be true, things like the year that you collected the data, the type of habitat you happen to report on your slate, uh, the site that you were on, maybe uh, the diver that you are, your individual diver profile, because for instance, I, on the same reef at the same window of time, will happen to report a lot more bluehead wrasse than Christie is because I just tend to see wrasse better. So we're going to account for all of these different effects in the same model. And importantly, we're going to connect the data stream that is reef with the data stream that is the federal survey. Those are the two X's there, the two X's, X1 and X2, to an observation process in a multivariate way. So we're going to put these two things into play into the exact same model. And then the final thing down here on the bottom right is going to set up a covariance structure. Okay, what that really means is we're gonna ask how correlated are these things? How correlated are these time series? Okay. Big picture, first this, 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 map, this graph should make you feel good. Each of these dots here represents an individual species across the entire window of time. On the y-axis here, you're looking at the mean encounter rate of individuals from reef surveys. And on the x-axis, along the bottom, you're seeing the mean encounter rate from the roving visual, excuse me, the, yeah, um, the, the reef visual census. That's the, that's the type of cylinder survey that the federal scientists do. And so what you'll see if you squint at this is a, is a, is a correlation. So in general, when reef surveyors see relatively abundant species, so do the federal scientists and vice versa. Okay, so that's step one that make, should make us feel pretty good. Okay, we're doing okay. We're reporting what the federal scientists are recording. If we actually then take our full-fledged model and we plot those time series through time, so take a look at the top left, that's black grouper. The red line represents reef survey estimates of abundance through time. So abundance is on the y-axis and again on the x-axis here is years. And the blue represents the federal data. 
And what you'll see, I think, if you're squinting at it, is that they track remarkably well, remarkably well. You can see the ebb and flow of that data over time. Same thing for spotted goatfish, same thing for banded butterfly fish, and to a lesser extent, some of the other parrotfish species. So despite the fact that I think often us as surveyors, we feel like, what are we doing? What, what is this survey that, that I'm producing right now? How much does this actually make a difference? But collectively, as an aggregate, through those thousands of surveys, we generate powerful data. The types of data that match or are better, in some cases, at tracking trends through time, than what, would, what it would take to fund a, a very large, expensive, long-term federal monitoring program. So we can make a difference just through our individual efforts because we're contributing to this larger project. And why does that matter? Well, you get to something like Goliath Grouper, and this has become important here in, in, in South Florida and in the United States in general. Why? Because, well, it recovered. That's a good news story, um, but it's got a tint of bad. And the tint of bad is um, there's been a lot of growing pressure to, to open up that fishery because it's been protected for a long time now. Um, and so uh, the, there is a need in the resource management aid community to better understand what actually is going on with this species through time. Is it recovering? How it was recovering? How is it changing through time? And, and what with reef data, we're able to show, um, yes, it was recovering. It was, in fact, recovering remarkably well up through the early 2010s. Uh, but then something happens, probably having to do with uh, red tide and cold snaps and you see a population decline. This you will not see in the federal data. You will not see this in RVC. Why? Because RVC does very constrained small area counts, which is really important because they want to get at density. We don't do that. We sacrifice that very rigorous point count data for, uh, for the ability to see lots of things, including Goliath grouper. So while they very rarely or ever have Goliath grouper swimming through a small cylinder that they're surveying. If there is a Goliath grouper on a reef, let's say alligator reef, you're probably going to see it as a reef diver. And so we have much more sensitive data to report big rare things. And you can see that pattern in the data. This is truly one of the best, if not the best pieces of information that the state has right now to say something about what's going on with the population. And it was used to make decisions, unfortunately. They did open up the fishery, and that's another, another whole story. But the point of this analysis and showing you this data is to demonstrate that your data that you are generating matter, and they, they actually they generate use, very useful information. They track true trends through time. And in some cases, at least, they provide the only piece of data available for, to do fisheries management well. OK, so that's abundance. That's how many creatures you see. But in fisheries management, the other key piece of information is how big are the fish you see. How big are they? So size matters a lot in fisheries. Oh, this is an old version, but that's okay. So um, this is uh, a well-known concept in fisheries. So you probably, some of you, especially if you came through a biology or an ecology program uh, as, your, as your college degree, you heard about fishing down the food webs, right? So when there's strong fishing pressure happening, you tend to take the biggest fish out of the system, whether or not you're taking the biggest species out of the system or you're taking the largest individuals out of the system. Um, if we focus on just a particular species, um, what, what we know to be true is that uh, larger fish produce many more eggs than do younger fish. They produce exponentially more eggs. Um, so those larger fish are actually the most fecund, meaning they have the most reproductive potential of the individuals in the population. We also know that in general, we should expect a size frequency distribution, which is this graph here on the left, I know that sounds very fancy, but really all this is is just um, relative numbers of creatures in each one of these bins. Let's say this is Goliath grouper. And so that the higher the bar is, the more individuals there are in this particular size class. Size class is indicated here on the x-axis. In a version population where no fishing is taking place, you might expect the distribution to look like this, including those orange bars. When fishing takes place, those larger individuals are removed from the system. And so we can actually compare the distribution, the length frequency distribution of what a true population looks like based on measuring bunches of, bunches of fish to what we would expect that population to look like based on natural history parameters of things like growth and survival, which, which are, are typically known quantities in fisheries or at least well estimated. 
Those two pieces of data together, in, including information about how fecund or how, how much reproductive potential larger individuals have, allows us to calculate things like spawning potential ratio, which is a key metric in fishery science that tells us, as a roll-up, how, how heavily fished a population is. So the, the more larger individuals are removed from a population, the less reproductive that whole population has. We can't do that right now with reef data. Why? Because we only get abundance. We don't get size. So can we, can our community add a little bit? Can we do something new? Can we, can we help the fisheries managers to get that additional piece of information, to get that other critical piece to the puzzle of fisheries management? So we've started to do that work. Um, I'll say that the, the, the way that this is done with those federal scientists that we talked about, this is how they do it. So um, they'll go down and they do visual estimates. So here's a diver holding out a pole with a T and then at the end of that T is a known distance of PVC. And I use that then to eyeball the size of that, in this case, red grouper and say, okay, that's probably 42 centimeters. And I write it down. Okay, that's, that's how the feds do this work. Let's revisit our boatload of lovable yahoos. I, this is an older version of this talk, which is really unfortunate because I think it's going to matter here in a little bit. Um, dang it. Okay. Um, okay, so can these guys generate the information that, that, that we need to get at size frequency data? Ah, well, I wanted to say, um, as you'll note in, the, in that boatload of, of, of reef divers, every single one of them has one of those, right? How many people here have uh, a dive camera? and dive with it regularly. How many of you use those dive cameras to do fish ID because your eyeballs aren't the way they used to be? Okay, yeah, you and me both, friends. Um, so born, and that was, if I'd asked you that question 10 years ago, that's not the answer, right? So this is rapidly, rapidly evolved. Most of those people, I would bet, have a TG, right? A TG camera. And the reason is uh, they take great pictures. It's a waterproof camera and then it's inside a waterproof case. For people like me, that's great because there's, you know, half again the chance of that camera flooding because of, of falling hair or whatever. So TGs, and they're cheap. That's the other big advantage of them. So they're, they're everywhere. Can we, can we leverage this device that almost every reef surveyor has now in order to capture length frequency data? Um, and what we've come up with, we started working with a team of engineers at, at UC San Diego, and we've generated this device right here. When this is just simply your TG, now it's got a, um, a small dome port on it, a fisheye lens, and on the top of it, it's got a laser. And that laser is gonna help us to get at sizes of fish. How? Oh man, here comes some more math, right? So I'm not gonna go through this. Hey, just take it on faith that, um, when you know the, the, the focal width of the, of the image that's being taken by your camera and you know the offset distance between the center of your focal width and where that laser is, and you can estimate the angle of that laser relative to the center of that focal width of the camera, if you can do all of that, if you can do all of that, you can calculate Z. And Z is the distance of the fish or the place where the laser is hitting to your camera. Right? All you need is one laser mounted in a hot shoe on your TG. We can estimate everything else through the magic of engineering. Um, and that will give us the ability to calculate the size of fish. And this is actually part of um, PhD work from um, a PhD student in the engineering department, Christopher Crutchfield. You guys, I'm gonna have to apologize. There's a bunch of pictures that are missing of folks that are involved in this. So I'm just gonna name names. Uh, this is also funded by the Office of Naval Research, if you can believe that. Um, the Navy cares about these sorts of things as well. So here is our weaponry, here's our arsenal, uh, prior to taking them out on the boat. And um, here is another boatload of, of um, lovable fish geeks, geeks and oceanful. Um, so we've got Jen in the middle. Uh, Jen is uh, a postdoc on this project. She's kind of leading the effort. She's in the room, probably. Yes, she is, there she is. Um, and Jen is, is helping to kind of coordinate all this effort. We've got Dylan Appel. Dylan's in the room. David is, Dylan's not, David is not. Okay, so um, uh, reef, reef connoisseurs all around. And um, so we, we jump in the water and we collect information using these cameras by selecting a subset of species for which the, the, the state and feds uh, need quite a bit of information that is currently lacking. 
here's an anecdote. I'm going to try and do this quickly, but black grouper, really important fishery. Actually, is a commercial fishery for black grouper. Length, frequency, and abundance is usually important for assessment. Guess how many records of black grouper lengths there are from catch data in the last year or so? Far less than 100. Far less than 100. Something in the ballpark, I think of what it was like 20 or 30. Remarkably low numbers of, of catch data. So, if it, so any data that we can generate on that species is useful data for fisheries management, is useful. This is why we're doing this. So um, we, we started this effort, here's, here's Dylan actually now using the camera underwater. So he's got, you can barely see it, but there's a hogfish in the foreground. See him right here, camo. And there's the, there's the laser dot on the hogfish. He's doing a great job. Good job, Dylan. Uh, and this was posted by our, our funders for this project. This is the South Atlantic Fisheries Management Council. This should give you an indication of how important this data is. The Fisheries Management Council here is the one that funded this project. because They view this as very, very important. And even though we still haven't formalized the process of putting all of this data into play in terms of a citizen science program, it's already been highlighted in NOAA's Federal Southeast Region Saltwater Recreational Fisheries Management Plan. They've literally called us out as, yeah, this is where the future is going for monitoring, this program. So it's, it's cool. Um, now we just got to build it because <laughs> they said we had to. So, <laughs> Okay, so, um, so stay tuned on that. We're still developing it. We're still in, there's, there's a bunch behind the scenes that happens, including AI, leveraging AI to actually pull those fish links out of, out of the, those images and figuring out how, how you all as citizen science can participate in that project. Stay tuned, Jen's gonna figure it all out and tell us what to do and it'll be awesome. Good job, Jen. It's one, two, skip a few and we're done, right? Okay, so taxonomy for the masses. This is another project for the future that, that Reef is, is starting to implement now. Um, turns out when you swam today, if you, how many people went in the water today? Okay, when you were swimming, you were swimming in a soup of DNA. You probably didn't know it didn't look like a soup of DNA, but you were in fact swimming in a whole heap load of DNA uh, from lots of different creatures, not just fish, but 100% when you were swimming, you were swimming in fish DNA. And in the last five, 10, maybe 15 years, but really more like five years, we started to figure out how to collect that water and actually interrogate it for what's in it. We started to figure that out. And um, so this, Science is evolving remarkably rapidly. It, it's stunning to see how fast the science is, 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 is evolving. And we're trying to stay at the forefront of this and leverage this new science and, and incorporate it into our citizen science. The idea here is that you've got some droplet of water. It has some DNA in it. And you can do one of two things with it. You can do what's called um, polymerase chain reactions or qPCR, or you can do next-gen sequencing. QPCR on the top is going to give you four particular species, the total amount of DNA in that water droplet, and the, the next generation sequencing on the bottom there is going to tell you something about the cacophony of different species that exist in that water droplet. Okay, and we can use different regions of the genome in the DNA that's floating around that is particularly sensitive to divergences among species as the template for the library that we then use to read for the different species. Okay, so for fishes, we're going to probably use something like 12S, which is a region of the gene. And then the my fish underneath that is the library that allows us to match the string of letters from the DNA to the species that exist in that library. Okay, but the cool thing is, if we can do this, let's ostensibly say for fish, we're not just getting the DNA from fish, we're getting the DNA from fish, marine mammals, invertebrates, bacteria, all of it is in that droplet of water. So it greatly expands our taxonomy. And you don't need to know what species of bacteria you're, the goo that you're floating around in, right? As long as you can get that, that DNA into a filter, we can figure it out. So it's, it's, it's almost like democratizing this taxonomy business, right? It just, just requires that we go out and collect the water. So we did that. Um, this Lex and Steve, uh, which the, the picture was on here, but it's no longer. Lex and Steve uh, helped us out with this project. This was down in the Sea of Cortez. How many folks have dove in the Sea of Cortez? Uh, yeah, Gulf of California. Okay, so this was from the reef trip from last year. That little puck there on their, 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 uh, their tank right there, see that? It's, here it's covered in a plastic bag uh, in order to avoid contamination. It didn't work very well. 
DNA is really sticky and there's a lot of it. It's really weird. But anyway, so we put this puck on the back of the divers and it's not like sucking water or anything. It's just literally a filter. We just put it on and they swim around the ocean with it and then we take it off and we stick it in some preservative. We bring it back to the lab. So we've done this work, brought it back to the lab um, and lo, we get fish. We get lots of fish. So I'm going to walk through some of the, the creatures, especially for those who have dove a bunch in the Sea of Cortez, because it, it's interesting, I think. What I also think is interesting is, so here is two species taxonomy. We get a lot more taxonomy than this, but these are only the species that are identified two species uh, as the lowest level of taxonomy. Uh, a couple of the names here. Who knows what Bos Taurus is? Yes, Ken. That's right, we do. We got a, what, what about Felis caddis? That shouldn't be hard for everybody. All right. Uh huh. There's, they probably served beef and pork on that boat, and somebody had a cat, right? <laughs> somebody had a cat. And oh, oh, yeah, humans are everywhere. Let me tell you guys. I don't know if you know this or not, but humans. They, they leach DNA. Okay, so let's ignore those because this is a very, very sensitive technique. Those, that's not surprising. And in fact, it happens in, in most surveys of eDNA. Let's zoom in instead to the species of fish. Topmost uh, captured fish in terms of DNA was mahi-mahi. How many people have seen mahi-mahi while diving ever? Okay, in Sea of Cortez? Yeah, so, it's, so it's, when you see mahi-mahi diving, that's a good day right? Not common. But we dive on a thin ribbon around a great blue ocean. And in that great blue ocean, there are a huge number of mahi-mahi. We just don't see them because we're on the thin outer ribbon of that ocean. So this is kind of, it highlights the difference between what eDNA can tell us and what diving, diving can tell us. And I think that difference is important because it, it highlights the fact that this as a tool, it's different but it's also going to be useful for those different reasons. So dolphin is number one. Number two, this should be no surprise, Pacific Creole fish. Number three, scissor tail chromis. Number four, zebra perch, and so on. So, oh, the flat iron herring. So you've probably seen those in Sea of Cortez as a giant school sometimes, right? Okay, so we get um, lots of different species of fish. And, uh, oh, yes, uh, Cortez grunt. And we got this guy. So we, we, we use the different region of, of the gene uh, the genes in the DNA, CO1. And CO1 tells us a lot about marine mammals. So we were hoping we were going to get sperm whales and lots of other things. Again, this is partially funded by the Office of Naval Research. And it should come as no surprise to anybody. The Navy cares a lot about marine mammals because they're not interested in doing damage to marine mammal populations. And in order to avoid doing that damage, they need to know where marine mammals are so they can avoid doing things where marine mammals are. So eDNA provides them a lot of potential to get that information. So they funded some of this project as well. So we get that. Who knows what this is? Any marine mammal people in the room? It's a fur seal. It's a Guadalupe fur seal. Oh, man, we were like, oh, okay, this is not working. There's no fur seals in the Sea of Cortez. That's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. And then we start pointing or poking around, and it turns out, ah, in fact... <laughs> Uh, just the year previous, there was a, a new Guadalupe fur seal colony discovered in the uh, Gulf of California. It recently reestablished. Apparently, they used to be there and they were extirpated, and now they've established a new breeding colony. So it just highlights the sensitivity of this tool for, for things like discovering changes in range distributions uh, or potentially things like getting at invasive species. All right, so... That's really cool, um, but we didn't get a huge diversity of fishes like we were expecting, and so we're thinking, could we do better than that? Um, I'm wishing I had better my, my older slides, but so we developed this thing now, um, and I say we, how many people have been on a reef trip with my dad? <laughs> okay, a couple of you. My dad, Michael Sammons, uh, is also, like you, uh, a, a reef member and a, a surveyor. He also was uh, a professor at the University of Minnesota in, in environmental and civil engineering. And when I told him that we were doing eDNA, he got super excited. And, and I said, well, we really need something to do better than just passive filtering in the water. We want to do some active filtering because we want to get more quantitative. We want to pull in some set amount of water and filter a parcel of water. And we wanted to get more DNA than a passive filter might pick up. And he said, ah, I can help you with that. 
I've got a project now because he's retired. So he gets a project. So this is his project and he's been bashing at this thing now for the last couple of, of, of months. And this is what we've, what he's come up with. And inside here um, is a battery, a rechargeable battery and a small pump. Uh, and the things on the outside edge here uh, are, are an input and an output. The thing in the cylinder on the very top, the, the cylindrical thing on the very top is a filter, DNA filter. And so he, he created this device and he really wanted to get it tested underwater. And so he's like, oh, well, I, he's in Minnesota, another key piece of information. He's in Minnesota, which is a very landlocked state, as, as you probably are all aware. And so he's like, well, I really want to get this in the water. So um, I'm going to, uh, I'll get on Facebook and I'll just write to the local dive community on Facebook and see whether or not somebody's willing to take this out. Well, reefs reach is broad, wide, vast, and deep. And the moment that thing got posted on Facebook, Will and Alice, where are they? Okay, I apologize for the picture you sent me. is not in here. I don't know why that happened. But they immediately pounce on this. They're like, well, we're in Minnesota. Why are you not writing to us? I'm offended is basically what happened. I got texts. And my phone was blowing up with Alice's text. I mean, why is your dad not? There's a bunch of yahoos over here. Why are you not texting me directly? Yeah, you, they, they, are the, they are the lovable yahoos. A very different thing between yahoos and lovable yahoos. It's one, one word, but a big difference. So anyway, so they hooked up, and, and Alice and Will then, then took this device. Uh, I gather from stories that I've heard, Will was like, absolutely not. I'm not going diving. And then like the next day, he's in the water. <laughs> and, and, and here they are testing out this device, which um, engineers in the room, anyone? Um, okay, so... Uh, it failed, which is not surprising because it was the first iteration. It worked for 15 minutes. Okay, that's that's the glass half full uh, description of the situation. <laughs> so um, it worked for a while and then it failed. How about that? Is that better? So, but we're, this is a work in progress. So we're we're, we're actively trying to improve on this uh, approach, but with with the ultimate goal into the future of um, <clears throat> of doing a better job of serving the, the ocean with the new tools uh, that are coming online. So the last thing I'll, I'll say is that, um, why are we doing all of this? Why are we trying to evolve? Why are we trying to change? And we, we exist right now in this window of time where Reef has been here for 30 years, and that's awesome, that's amazing. What does the next 50 look like? What's the next 100 look like? Let's hope that, that Reef is around for that much longer. And in that window of time, we're going to get ocean temperatures changing by roughly 2 degrees C, more or less here. Some places a lot more than that. We are in a window of time right now where things are changing faster than they ever have. And, and it's ramping. It's ramping up. So we, we exist in a window of time where um, it, it behooves us as a community being, by the way, the world's largest citizen science diving-based nonprofit. We as a community... We exist in this window of time where we should be doing everything we can to try and generate the amount of information necessary to lessen that blow so that these resources that we care about are around into the future. And that's, so that's what we're trying to do here. We're trying to adapt and evolve the way in which we generate these data to meet the future needs so that we can continue to enjoy the things we love into the future. Cool. Thank you. All right, well, that was fun. Um, so uh, thank you all. Um, I, we are going to um, head over to the For the Love of the Sea. And um, for those of you who don't know where you're going, it's north and it's on the bay side. Um, if you're not joining us um, and you're bidding us uh, goodbye, thank you so much for joining us at Reef Fest this year. If you're not coming tonight, but you're going to Penny Camp tomorrow morning, enjoy that. It's going to be amazing. Um, remember, if you can, to park in U-Haul parking lot, if you're willing to walk just a little bit. And thank you very much. We so appreciate everybody staying until the end. So thank you. Thank you.